Well, good evening, church. Ooh, that was surround sound. Uh, my name is Tyler, if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you. I'm one of the pastors here at Life Mission Church. So I was thinking, I was preparing this, this is the fifth time I'll be preaching. And the last four times have all been different. Um, the first two times were pre-COVID. The next was online only. Then with a modified capacity. And now we're outside with tacos. This one's probably my favorite. <laughs> uh, well, I'm excited to preach the good news tonight. And I'm glad it's not 85 degrees wearing a sport coat. I think Joby likes the heat because I know he likes to bring the heat. <laughs> so speaking of heat, um, there's a section in 1 Peter that talks about trials purifying us like fire does to gold. This is not the scripture we'll be covering or looking at today, but it reminded me of this heat we've been having. The fire that is Valley Center in Escondido's sun seems to be doing the same for me. All the impurities are making their way to the surface. As sweat pours down my brow, so does the frustration, impatience, and complaints pour out of my mouth. My response to being uncomfortable is less than perfect. In today's text, we're going to be looking at a few different responses that happen before Jesus feeds the multitude, the 5,000. There is a response of Jesus, and as you may guess, that's the response we want to model. But then there are other examples that I believe land closer to home. So now let me kind of set up first what's going on here before I read and pray from chapter 6 of John. So Jesus has just responded to the Pharisees, right? And he has clarified that he has the authority of God the Father, and even Moses testified of him. And I read something very insightful in a commentary that I think will help further show the tension that we saw in chapter 5 and the significance of what is going on now in chapter 6. And it said this, Imagine if you combine George Washington with the Pope or with Billy Graham, so that Washington was not only the founder of your nation, but he was also the leader of your religion. Even if you did that, you would still not come close to matching how the Jews felt about Moses. But in the end of chapter 5, we see that Jesus reminds them that it is he that Moses pointed towards. Moses was just a mere shadow of the freedom from oppression that Jesus came to accomplish. Israel was looking for someone like Moses to lead them out of Roman's rule, Rome's rule. But as epic and insurmountable as the Roman rule seemed, God was going after a rule far more destructive. Because who cares about Rome when sin and death are enemies that will conquer even Rome itself? And today, right now, the enemy of sin and death are still seeking to destroy. Moses was their savior, and they weren't prepared to accept the fact, the fact they knew, by the way, that a greater Moses and a Messiah was coming, and how it had come now in Jesus. But just like the Jewish people, we can get nearsighted that we miss the bigger picture. The Jewish people wander the desert after walking on dry ground through the Red Sea, and they complain about the lack of food. So God provides bread from heaven manna, and more quail than they knew what to do with. They get thirsty and they complain. So God instructs Moses to strike a rock and it gushes forth water. Yet that was not the end of their complaint. So we too are quick to notice our lack and we forget the abundance of the Father's lavish grace. And I hope today that we see that God provides everything we need. I hope we will trust in our Savior all the more as we see he is the life we need. Now let me pray before we jump into the text this morning. Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would humble our hearts this morning. Would you reveal to us more deeply the great love in which you have for us in your Son, May you draw us to the Savior all the more as we recognize the inability in of ourselves 
to save ourselves. Thank you, Jesus, for coming in grace, patience, and humility that we may look and see the cross as marvelous as it truly is. Lead us and guide us this evening. Amen. So if you guys want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 6, we'll be in 1 through 15. And if you guys don't have a Bible, let us know and we'll get one for you to keep. And that goes for you guys who are streaming. If you want to let us know, we'll send you a Bible wherever you are. So I'm going to read from chapter 6, starting in verse 1. So after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred nanari worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in this place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftovers and the fragments that nothing be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. All right, so let's look at that first word and then verse one, after. After what? So this is referring to the fact that Jesus had just explained to the Jews who were accusing him of breaking the law of Moses that he was truly the son coming with all authority in heaven and earth. And there was this crowd of thousands of people following Jesus because of the amazing things he was doing. And here we see a lot of familiarity, actually, with Moses and Jesus. Moses, too, had crowds following him because of the signs he was doing. Now, I do think there were people that were not only following him because of the signs he was doing, but I still think they had different ideas in how the Messiah was going to save them. See, Moses was sent to rescue the people from slavery in Egypt. And now Rome is running the place. So they think the Messiah has come to once again save them from government rule. But he has come to rescue them from a different rule. And even though they, were, they may have been misguided, some misguided expectations of Jesus, we see in the Gospel of Mark, his account says that Jesus saw the crowd as sheep without a shepherd, and was filled with compassion. But first, we're going to look at some other of the responses to the crowd, which may be more relatable to how our minds and hearts work. So in verse 7, we see Philip's response to Jesus' request that was testing and probing about how they were to feed the sea of people. Right? Jesus asked him, where are we to buy the bread so that these people may eat? And Philip basically says, we can't afford that. That would be more than 200 denarii. And just like that, he failed the test. <laughs> you see, 200 denarii was equivalent of eight months' salary. So at face value, his response seems appropriate. In Philip's mind, it was illogical to think that they could provide enough for the multitude. How could they continue to provide for themselves? if they were to buy food for this crowd of strangers, even if they did have enough money, there just are so many people, it just isn't possible. Now, to get a little personal, I don't know about you, but this kind of response has come up in my life. 
God, I just don't have enough. Lord, how is this going to work? I have a family of five in Southern California. There is no way we're going to make it. Oh, and you want me to be generous? With what? That right there was a true point in my walk. My heart was in a bitter place at one point when it came to God's provision and the generosity he was calling me to do. My heart failed to see who I was talking to, kind of like Job calling God out. Or like Joby described last week, with my hand in front of my face and I'm complaining I can't see. In Matthew 6, 25 through 27, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither reap nor sow or gather up into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour of span to his life? In our humanness, we look at problems with their solutions based on previous experiences either we've had personally or that we've seen through someone else's experiences. Now, moving on to the next response we have is Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And in verse 9, he says, There's this boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And that may be one of the big buts in the Bible. <laughs> he started off strong, then sinks quickly. And I imagine as Philip was going to give or was giving his response, Andrew was frantically looking to be a part of the solution and not the problem. He sees a boy holding a basket of fish and food, and the boy looks back at him with like a face of understanding. And Andrew, now, he has something to say when the capital T teacher calls on him. Kids, have you guys ever had that feeling? Another kid or sibling, your brother or sister, fails to answer the question correctly, but you're trying to think of a response to respond to for the same question? Oh, he just got in trouble. Hopefully I can answer better. <laughs> However, within the response from Andrew, I like to think there is another response we might not know or recognize. Now, C.S. Lewis said, reason is the natural organ of truth and imagination is the organ of meaning. And so I imagine in a scene, and this is just me trying to put myself into the scene in a C.S. Lewis kind of way, but this boy with the food has a response. John is the only one to record where they got the bread and fish from fish from. Even so, the boy had very little to offer, but I like to think he gave knowing Jesus could do more. Maybe this boy, because was with him, had seen the miraculous glory in Jesus' ministry thus far. Just maybe he was one that Jesus referred to when he said, unless you have faith like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Maybe he witnessed what Ephesians 3.20 tells us, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And I pray that our hearts would respond more to circumstances with that first rather than doubt. But without the continual work of the Holy Spirit, this is not possible. For apart from him, we can do nothing. Even though it was mere speculation, but we do re know and read that they received bread and fish from a boy, and Jesus used this small offering to bless the multitude. Everyone ate till they were satisfied, and they collected all the leftovers. Let me say that again. They collected all the leftovers. Not just crumbs, but 12 baskets full. Now my kids, hi kids, <laughs> they're learning math right now, and they have been. And right now, because I know it'll be more difficult, I enjoy teaching them how to find the answer. Because in arithmetic, there is an answer. So they know 12 minus five equals seven, right? Or 12 divided by three equals four. But the math in this story does not add up. Right? There are five loaves of bread and two fish. We're going to get in a little math here. 
<laughs> so let's just say for the sake of simplicity, we have seven items of food, and there are 5,000 men. And yet everyone, including those not counted in the 5,000, ate and were satisfied. And then they collected 12 baskets full of leftovers. Okay, so you have seven minus 5,000 equals 12. Kids, is that right? Seven minus 5,000 equals 12? No. <laughs> the answer is no, thank you. Jesus provides everything and more for this multitude of people. His provision did not run out. And guess what? It never runs out. And when Jesus says to Paul in 2 Corinthians, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Philip may have been concerned that generosity would cause their lack. However, not only did the whole crowd eat till they were full, but the leftovers would continue to sustain them. So now that brings us back to Jesus' response. Now that we have looked at the responses we more relate to, let us turn our hearts to the eyes of the sustainer of life. So I mentioned a few moments ago, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> water. Now Mark tells us that when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. He saw a hungry sheep in need of a shepherd that can lead them to pasture. In John 6, 5, it says, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people can eat? And then in the account in Mark in chapter 6, it says, He saw the large crowd and he had compassion on them. Now I want to first remind and or tell you what has just happened that shows a glory of the Savior that I hope and pray the Holy Spirit would graciously use to transform us tonight. So Jesus, he had just confronted the Pharisees in their hypocrisy and knew that the nation of Israel was in the process of rejecting him. And not only that, but he had just received news that his cousin, John the Baptist, was beheaded. And we see that in Mark chapter 6 and Matthew 14. He and his disciples were attempting to rest, and I imagine for Jesus, an attempt to grieve. They went alone to the top of a mountain. They were going away. Now think about that. Jesus' cousin, who was written of in the prophets of old, to declare his coming, was just killed. He died for Jesus' sake. He died according to the will of the Father who Jesus had come to glorify and reconcile us to. To be honest, this has been weighing on my heart as I was preparing this. In the redeeming plan of God, the son's cousin, and the one to prepare the way for his ministry and then die because of him, John's life and death was used for the glorification of the son. That is just mind-boggling. And Jesus... He had submitted himself to become 100% man, one familiar with our grief and sorrows. Although he was still 100% God, he stepped down into pain and death and will later step into death itself. And whenever I think about God using the enemy of death for his glory, there's a mix of awe and pain. God, you are sovereign over an all. But in your sovereignty, pain and death is used for good? Help me to trust you. So this is what's been going on in the ministry of Jesus. He's been rejected by his people. His cousin, who, was, who called out in the wilderness, wilderness about him, as we read in John chapter 1, where he says, I baptize with water, but among you stands the one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie and then baptizes Jesus. That man, Jesus' cousin, was killed because of Jesus. And despite the physical, spiritual, and emotional exhaustion, he doesn't stop caring and showing compassion. Now let's uh, talk about my radical humanness. And I'm not saying that I'm radical, 
but that I'm really good at being a sinful human. Now, when I go to rest, that's what I expect to do. If large crowd, AKA my children, follow me to my resting place, my gut reaction is not normally one of compassion and patience. You see, I like to think of myself as a great power napper. I can set my timer for 23 minutes and I'll get 20 minutes of solid sleep. So when the crowds interrupt my 23 minutes, my response is normally, I just need 23 minutes. Now, how futile in comparison to Jesus' circumstances does it seem to get frustrated over 23 minutes? Or how about an hour? Or how about a day? Or for that matter, how about the year 2020? Though the disciples bid their master to send them away to a nearby village, Jesus continues to feast on the food that is accomplishing his father's will. Despite the large crowd following, most who seek only to be entertained, his response is compassion. Uh, C.H. Spurgeon has this question that he kind of poses to the disciples as if it was Christ asking. He says, why should hungry men depart from the householder, from him who feedeth all things, who openeth his hand, and satisfieth the desire of every living thing? There's also uh, something else majestic that happens right before Jesus tests Philip and turns his attention to the crowd. And it's just a few words but they've held my heart. It says, he sat down. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. This kingly reaction reveals to me that Jesus is not caught off guard. He's not concerned what will happen to his eternal reign. His sovereignty shines like a beam of light in this hopeless world. He is a shepherd that will feed his sheep for all eternity. And now, even now, he is seated at the right hand of God the Father, holding all things together. However, this world would not recognize him, would not recognize his heavenly throne. They would not see him as a good shepherd, but as an inconvenience, a disturbance to their plans, and for those in the crowd, a means to their end. And just like the woman at the well, she was looking to satisfy her physical thirst, and Jesus quenched her spiritual thirst. So too does this crowd look to be only satisfied temporarily by the one who has come to satisfy forever. Oh, that we would lift our eyes off of ourselves and gaze upon our Savior. We are fickle in our pursuits and a continually chase after the wind. But Christ offers eternal security and satisfaction by the means of his own body his own humility, his own willingness to step in the place of our judgment. Jesus satisfied all those who were following him that day by the breaking of bread. And on the cross, he satisfied the Father's wrath by the breaking of his body. God's wrath is a deep well of love and fury. But his grace and mercy are deeper still in his son, Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 9, talking about the priests of old, says, These preparations, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing ritual duties. But only to the second, the high priest goes, and but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and the unintentional sins of the people. Skipping down to Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. God gave manna, in the desert through the intercession of Moses. That bread was given daily and was not to be stored up. Jesus, he is the true bread from heaven. And even Moses testified about him and is the eternal satisfaction that was promised. 
In Isaiah 55, 2, I read this about the woman at the well as well. But it says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear to me, come to me, hear that your soul may live. Moses, by God's works, saved the people of Israel from the oppression of Egypt. Jesus, by his own works, has come to save those the Father has given from the oppression of sin and death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the goodness and graciousness you have poured out in your Son. Lord, you have sent our true Savior. Lord, you have satisfied all the longings and desires of our heart in your Son. Jesus, may we look only to you to quench our deepest desires. Jesus, would we stop looking into other things to temporarily satisfy, but find the eternal satisfaction that you have promised. Thank you, Jesus, for these truths. Thank you for taking my place and our place on the cross and satisfying the wrath of your Father. Lord, may we rejoice in getting to take part in the bread that is your body and in life and the blood, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.